We return this morning to Ephesians chapter 4, if you'd like to open your Bibles there. The second half of the chapter is all about how we as Christians have been called to a life of practical holiness. A life very different than the habits of sin that we were used to when we were lost. We're first given some general principles about holiness in verses 17 through 24. Principles like learning Christ and laying aside the old man and putting on the new man. And after stating those general things, the apostle then gets specific and gives us a list of, of Christian living uh, exhortations. Verse 25 is about telling the truth. Verses 26 and 27 about handling our anger without sin. Verse 28 is about our property, how we must not steal, but instead work hard and give generously. And so today we come to the next verse, verse 29, which is a word about our words, our verbal communication. My Bible says it like this, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. The ESV translation of Ephesians 4.29 is a little different. It says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. God created human beings with the ability to communicate using words. And it's a big deal, isn't it? It's, it's one, of the, one of the main things that makes us different than animals. The ability to use words. It makes possible deep personal relationships, doesn't it? Even relationships with God. We can communicate with all persons. Most of us spend hours each day in the realm of words. We spend hours talking with our mouths or talking with our thumbs on our phones. We spend, spend time sending emails. We spend time posting on social media. Some of us do. Our words are powerful. They can produce so much good or so much trouble, can't they? There's a verse in Proverbs 12 that talks about this. Proverbs 12.18, it says, There's one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. <laughs> it's like these two extremes, right? Your words can be like somebody stabbing you with a sword, or your words can be like a doctor bringing healing in a time of need. And we're capable of, of both things in the space of five minutes, aren't we? Doing a lot of good or a lot of trouble. James, describing our tongue in, in James 3, says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be this way. Brethren, we know how easy it is to sin with our words. I mean, most of us can think back from just the last week of ways we failed with our mouths. <laughs> things we said we are ashamed of today. In that same chapter of James 3, he, he talks about how we all stumble in many ways. He says, if somebody does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Because speech is so important, because we stumble so easily in it, it's no wonder that the Bible has a lot to say about our talk, about our words, about our speech. I've just been reading through Proverbs this week down at the lake, and, and I mean, there are so many verses about, about our words in different ways. God's given us so much directions. I'll mention a few verses as we go along, but, but there's plenty to talk about right here in verse 29. Notice this verse has the same kind of basic pattern we've seen previously in chapter 4. 
in which there's a negative side and a positive side. The idea of you've got to lay aside the old man and put on the new man, right? So, so he says there's something not to do. You need to stop using the rotten words and start using the good words, the edifying words, the appropriate grace-giving words instead. And so we'll just use that as our, our, our kind of two-part outline here. First, the negative side. The negative side of our words, the bad words, the bad words. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. The ESV, no corrupting talk. I mean, literally, the Greek word is, is a word used for something rotten, like spoiled, stinking food, okay? That's, that's the imagery here. Um, and, and so, man, some of our words can be just that way, just foul. Uh, damaging, defiling, and and when you think of think of rotten words, you might think first of all of of, of things like obscenity and vulgarity, and you know, cussing and dirty jokes and and salacious stories. What in 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 Ephesians five verse four he uses uh, the term coarse jesting, coarse jesting. Uh, this kind of talk is so common in the world. And, and, and a lot of us are in environments at school or at work where we're just surrounded by a lot of, a lot of foul talk, a lot of, a lot of bad language. And, and so this kind of language it might be floating around our heads a lot of the time. Uh, but this verse is saying we need to keep it from coming out of our mouths. It shouldn't proceed from our, from our mouths. And I, I think most Christians figure this out pretty fast. I think most Christians can clean up that kind of talk pretty fast after they are saved. They, they stop cussing uh, pretty soon after they're converted. Now, now sometimes when they're under stress, maybe, maybe some cuss words slip out. I think that's what happened with the Apostle Peter uh, when he denied the Lord. It says, it says he began to curse and swear. And, and, you know, Peter was quickly ashamed of that, quickly repentant and weeping. And we too are shamed when we sin with, with that kind of rotten language. I think though that most of us struggle more with other kinds of unwholesome words. I don't think it's so much cuss words that's our problem. It's other stuff, right? Unkind words. Uh, insulting, harshly critical words. What Colossians 3 verse 8 calls abusive speech kind of know what that is. Uh, those are definitely rotten words, and those words target the people we love the most, often, to our shame. Another category would be gossip words, gossipy words, when we're just enjoying passing on bad stuff about somebody else for the entertainment value. Uh, slanderous words. Uh, here in verse 31, at the end of the chapter, it mentions slander. Slander, I mean, it's saying negative things about somebody that are not true. They're not true. They're slanderous. False teaching, doctrinal error. That could be another form of really damaging, unwholesome words, right? If you tell somebody, this is what God says, His Word, we better be right about it. Because it can do damage if we're wrong. So, how much trouble, how much damage, how much havoc these unwholesome words can cause. James, in, in that same chapter of James 3, he, he, he talks about the tongue being a small part of the body. He says it's like a little fire that can set ablaze a whole forest. And so our words, just a few words, can cause so much trouble how many, how many rotten words are okay? <laughs> What's our quota? How many can we get away with and it's still okay? How often can I say mean stuff to my wife and it's alright? What does the Bible say in the verse? What does the verse say? It says, it says zero. <laughs> it says no, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. God's standard is really high. None of that. No, you need to cut it all out. We need to stomp it out. Get rid of it, he says. Proverbs 10 warns us, when there are many words, 
transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. David prayed in Psalm 141, verse 3, he says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. It feels like as Christians that most of the time we're trying to restrain ourselves. Most of the time we're trying to stay out of trouble with our words, trying to be careful. I think it's crucial also that we see these speech sins not just like a bad habit that we need to fix, but that we realize that our speech sins are usually a symptom of something deeper, of a heart problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, something that we need to repent of and root out. That is what the Lord Jesus taught us. Uh, in Luke 6, verse 45, He says, The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good, and the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Where do our words come from? Where do these rotten words come from? Well, there's something rotten in our hearts that's driving that. If I keep talking mean to somebody, if I keep being harsh in my words toward people, it shows I've got a heart problem. Right? It shows I have a problem that I don't love them enough. Or it shows I have a problem with pride. I have a problem with self-righteousness. I've got something deeper going on. And if by God's grace I can deal with the deeper sin issue, then my words, my language will probably improve too. And I'll start talking to people in a kinder, more gracious, loving way. And this is definitely an area where we can help each other. Right? We can help each other to stamp out rotten words from our... our our talk. A bunch of you have been faithful to help me over the years in, in seeing the rottenness of my own words. And I mean, you've been faithful to say, hey man, that sounded mean. You know, that wasn't kind. That wasn't true. I think that was slanderous. I think you got that wrong. And I'm so thankful for that. Uh, Pointing out words that do damage. Now it could be I didn't intend to, to say anything wrong. But we all have big blind spots, don't we? In the way our words come across. And, and how they affect people. And so if we're serious about stamping out all the unwholesome words. If we don't want any of them to proceed from our mouth. Then we'll listen to each other's admonitions this way. Well, that's a little bit on the negative side. Not saying the bad words. But I mainly want to talk today about the positive side. What God says about our good words and the good they can produce. You might think, well, you know, I sin so easily when I talk. I'll, I'll just not say anything. I'll just kind of sit in the background. I'll just be quiet. I'll just stay out of trouble here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, sister. Sorry, brother. Doesn't work that way. Um, the verse not only warns about the bad words, but it commands us to speak with good words instead. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it will give grace to those who hear. Yeah, it can be a sin to talk too little. It can be a sin not to be giving folks the good words that you're supposed to be ministering to them. And so, so how do we know what these good words are? How do, how do we find these good What are the characteristics of the good words that we're supposed to be aiming at? Well, the verse gives us three qualities, three characteristics of the good words. They are edifying, they are appropriate, and they are grace-giving. And so we'll talk about each of these. I think they're each one helpful as we try to evaluate, you know, am I using good words or bad words here? So first, edifying, edifying. It says for edification. That's a big word. Christians kind of use it. A lot of Christians aren't quite sure what it means, though. Edify. Well, you should, that should make you think of edifice, right? And edifice is the, kind of the front side of a building. 
The ESV is clearer. It just says building up. Yeah. It's saying picture the person you're talking to like a building that's under construction. <laughs> and your words can add something to that building. You can make that building a little bigger, a little better, a little stronger, a little safer, a little more comfortable, however you want to picture it. You can add to somebody else's construction in progress through your words. You can benefit them, add value to them, leave them a little better off than they were before they talked to you. Maybe a lot better off. Now when worldly people talk, their motive is often purely selfish. You know, it's just, it's just I want to make myself look good, I want to get attention, I want to show off how smart I am or how how funny I can be or whatever. I want all, everybody looking at me and impressed with me. But for the Christian here, they're thinking differently. Right? They're viewing our words to people with an attitude of love. They're thinking, how can my words benefit you? How can I build something in your life? How can I leave you better off? 1 Corinthians 10, 24, it says, Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. I mean, that's the Christian mentality. And it should be toward our words, toward our interactions, especially with each other in the church. Not seeking our own good, but the good of the neighbor. I want to edify you. I want to build you up. I want to believe you better off. Romans 14, verse 19. I've been thinking of this one a lot lately. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. That's, that's a good test, isn't it? Whether your words are edifying, are you pursuing what makes for peace and the building up of each other? Same idea. So, so we care how our words affect others. We want to help them, uplift them, encourage them, comfort them, instruct them, pass on some wisdom to them. But this does not mean that we're always just being nicey-nicey all the time. right? I mean, sometimes a word of correction is the thing that will be most edifying to somebody. Right? It's the thing they most need. The thing that will most help them in the long run is, is, is to point out that something's wrong. You know, A building that's being constructed, if there's a part of it that's going the wrong way, that's a little bit off, it's good to have a building inspector come in and say, hey, you're going to have to fix this. Because the sooner you fix it, the better off you are. Right, And then the building can continue on from there. Proverbs, another proverb on this. Proverbs 25, verse 12 says, Like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Kind of need both sides of that, don't we? Need a wise reprover. Some, some of us aren't too wise. Some of us are pretty, pretty clumsy at that. But also you need a listening ear. Somebody hear it. And when that happens, when you got both things, it can be great edification, great value in someone correcting us. All right, that's the first need. In our, in our good words, we need, they need to be edifying. Second thing it says about our good words is they are appropriate. Appropriate. The, the NAS translation says, according to the need of the moment. According to the need of the moment. The ESV says, as fits the occasion. And so the timing of things, when you say something, is important. The setting in which you are communicating is important. The particular needs of that particular person is important. The appropriateness. We can be saying true things, but saying them at the wrong time to the wrong person, the wrong setting, the wrong context, and it not be helpful. Actually, true things can bring discouragement and confusion if they're interjected in the wrong setting. But on the other hand, got some more Proverbs. Proverbs 15, verse 23, it says, A man has joy in an apt answer. 
and how delightful is a timely word. How delightful is a timely word. Have you ever gotten an encouraging text from somebody that came at just the right time? A timely word that just helped you, that met a need, that changed your whole week. How delightful is a timely word. Proverbs 25, verse 11. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. It's like gold, he says. A word in right circumstances. Oh, we're, we're challenged by this though, aren't we? In saying, saying good stuff in the wrong way. In making it inappropriate. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his, uh, his sermon on this verse was surprisingly, uh, surprising to me, surprisingly critical of how, of how Christians often approach one-on-one -on -one witnessing situations. Um, and he said we're often not at all sensitive to the other individual that we're trying to share the gospel with. And, and it comes across as inappropriate and it doesn't work. Uh, so a common example is is say the brand new zealous believer who's just sort of clumsily forcing <laughs> forcing the gospel into every single family situation uh, with their lost family members. What well, you know, whether there's an openness or not, feels like he has to he has to witness to them. And and you know, sometimes sometimes when we're with our lost family, the the need of the moment, the need of the moment is actually for you just enjoy being with them and laugh with them and be interested in their lives and be a friend to them. Right? That's the need of the moment. Rather than, rather than hitting them with the Gospel again. Other times, we witness ineffectively, Lloyd-Jones says, because we don't ask enough questions to understand where the other party really is at. And to meet him where he is. And instead, what we do, and I, I'm as guilty of this as any of you, is we kind of step back and we just launch this little gospel sermon in their direction. And, and uh, most of the time it just goes totally over their heads. And, but we walk away, we walk away feeling like, well, I did my duty. I did, I did the thing I was supposed to. I gave him the gospel. Now it's just in the Lord's hands. The Lord will have to use it. And, and Lord, Lloyd Jones says, hold on. This verse says it's your job to figure out what is an appropriate time, what's an appropriate word, what is fitting according to the need there with that individual. Have you tried to do that? You know, that lost person probably won't understand much of your theological jargon, but they'll definitely understand. They'll have some intuitive sense of whether you cared about them enough to try to understand them and understand what they really were. You know, were, was that Christian trying to address my real question here or not? Or was he just, just launching a bunch of stuff at him? You know, I feel like what I often do when I don't know what to say is just throw a bunch of different stuff at somebody and say, well, I hope some of it helps. But this verse is, is telling us that's not the best plan, is it? I want it to be appropriate according to the need of the moment. So we want to speak appropriately to lost people, but it's just as important when we talk to each other in the church. We want it to be appropriate. We want it to be fitting. We want it to really help somebody. And of course we can think of lots of examples of this. I'm thinking lately of, of, of controversial topics that we, we talk about. There's, there's difficult things in the Bible uh, like Ryan talked about last, last Sunday. There's there's stuff that's hard to understand. There's stuff that's hard to know the right thing to do. There's matters we know where saints that are smarter and godlier than us have reached different conclusions on. And we all want more light on these things. It's like, it's like this, this painful thing we want to fix over here and we want to keep going after it and get resolved and get it figured out. And... And, and we can, we can be like iron sharpening iron on these things. We can help each other as we talk about it. 
But I think there's also a danger of overdoing the controversy stuff and, and, and wearing people out and leaving the precious sheep kind of in a state of being troubled and confused about things rather than being edified. So how do we know these things? How, how do we discern all this stuff? You know, how, how do we handle the witnessing setting right? How do we handle you know, Christmas time at Grandma's house with all the lost family right? How do I handle conversations with other Christians you know, in the church here at a conference or whatever? How do I do that? And, you know, some of the stuff you can just kind of logically think through of what, what would probably be a good way to handle it. But, but the thought I just keep coming back to on this is how desperately I need to be in touch with God. I need to be walking in the Spirit. I need to hear the guidance of the Spirit inside me, prompting me, helping me, guiding my words, bringing Scripture to mind, bring, bringing thoughts, bringing insights that really will be beneficial to somebody else so that I'm not just throwing a bunch of stuff at them, but that God gives me the, the one thought that could really change their life, that could really help them right here. That's powerful, valuable ministry. And we need the Lord so much. I'm encouraged by by Jesus' promise to His disciples there. This is in Mark 13, verse 11. He says, When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. And so here's these disciples. Jesus says, they're, they're going to arrest you. They're going to put you on trial. You're going to be in some spot where all these... All these really smart people are going to be asking you really hard questions and you're, you're not even going to be able to prepare for it. And he says the Holy Spirit is going to help you in that moment with what you need to say. And, and so I'm, I'm going to take that promise for myself. You know, even though I'm not being arrested and put on trial, we're put in situations all the time. Where here we are. Here I've got to say something. Here I've got two minutes to figure out something worth saying. I've got to make a decision. I'm on the spot. And I need the help of the Holy Spirit. This same Holy Spirit that Jesus promised His disciples would help them. Surely I can look to the Spirit to help me in those same times. Because I, I want to give people fitting, timely, helpful words of truth. So we've talked about two things. Words need to be edifying. They need to be timely or appropriate. Fitting the need in the individual and then the third thing about these good words is they are grace-giving. It says so that it will give grace to those who hear. <laughs> that is so encouraging. I've been, I've been excited about this for the last two weeks. <laughs> this thing of our words can give grace to other people. It's what it says. If, if they are for edification, if they are given in the right setting then they, they will convey spiritual benefits, spiritual blessings to others. The Lord is using our words, my words, your words, to be, a, to be a pipeline of grace, a conduit of grace into somebody else's life. That's possible for you as a Christian. That's possible for all of us. Our words can do that. Lost people, saved people, people in your church, people in your family, complete strangers God brings across your path, random people in the Walmart parking lot like Ryan was telling us about. Our words seem so small. They're just words, right? But they can be used powerfully. Back there in the Proverbs, Proverbs 10, I noticed it, it refers to the Christian's words as being a fountain of life. In Proverbs 10, 11. And, and, and in, in the verse 21 of that same chapter, it says that our words can feed many. Provides life and food. And brethren, we need to believe this. We need to believe what the Bible says about the potential power and, and effectiveness of our words, your words to others. It can accomplish big things in people's lives. I can be giving grace to folks. 
I'm giving grace. Well, where does this grace come from? <laughs> where does this grace come from that I'm, that I'm giving to people? Well, well, obviously it's not from me. Right? This grace that I'm giving, I don't have, I don't have the power to fix anybody else. Right? This, this, grace, this grace isn't originating with me. It has to come from somewhere else. Where? Where's the grace come from? Well, how about the God of all grace, as Peter calls Him. The God of all grace. God is the source of, of grace. James calls Him the, the source of every good and perfect gift right, that comes down from above. Through our words, as we share God's Word and God's truth, we can help them to come to know the God of all grace. We can help put people in touch. We can point people in the direction of the God who is willing and able to graciously help them and do for them all the big things that they need in their life. And we can have a part in that. We can point them toward this God. And as they know Him better, as they look to Him in faith, particularly through the Lord Jesus, they'll receive more and more and more of His grace. And His grace is sufficient. Paul talks about that, you know, for himself in 2 Corinthians 12. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. It really, the grace of God is sufficient. I mean, it's what we need for every single problem. It's the grace of God that we ultimately have to have. And through our words... We can, we can help people get in touch with the God of all grace who helps them with every possible problem. Our words can give grace to those who hear. There's a similar verse in Colossians 4, uh, verse 6. We probably already thought of it. It says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt. Our words are supposed to be salted with grace. And, and I imagine as I've thought of that verse in the past, I've just thought of graciousness as being kind of a word for niceness or, or, or just being polite and pleasant in the way we talk, which of course is true, but I think it goes deeper than that. And, and I, I just, just this, this word grace, that this concept of I want the words I speak to be salted with grace. Real grace, God's grace, gospel grace. You know, in 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 my counseling with people, in my casual conversation, certainly my sermons, I want it to be with grace. I want it to be saturated with the grace of God. And I fear it often has not been. I just I feel like I've been content often to just give people mere information. You know, well, here's some facts for you. Or, or to try to solve their problem without bringing the Lord Jesus into the picture at all. Without bringing God in the source of grace. And it's just like, well, here's some solution. Like, try this or whatever. Or maybe, maybe what I do is just give people the law. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean by that? It's like, hey, bro. You're wrong. And here's a Bible verse that says you're wrong. And so now you need to straighten up and stop doing that and do the right thing instead. Um, well, that might all be true, but there's not much grace in that message, is there? <laughs> there's not much hope. You tell somebody that because probably the person is no, knows good and well that they're wrong. They've probably been struggling with that thing for a while. And it's not been working. They're frustrated. They're confused. They're maybe despairing. And so me coming along and just adding a little more condemnation isn't going to help matters much. What they need is not law in that case. They need grace. They need to be pointed to the God of all grace. And there's hope. There's hope then in that, right? There's a sort. Who is the source of all grace for sinners like us? Well, it's the... It's the crucified and risen and reigning Savior. The Lord Jesus. It's grace is found in Christ. Help is found in Christ. Real help is found in Him through Christ. Through this Savior that's, 
that's overflowing with grace and love and compassion and help. Through Him, there is, there is real help, real deliverance for all who repent and put their trust in Him. That's where the help is. That's where the hope is. It's in Christ. It's through grace in Christ. And through Christ's grace, our sins are forgiven. Through Christ's grace, He gives us power to overcome remaining sins. Those difficult things that are still messed up in our life. There's grace from Christ to help with that. And we can be the source of communicating that reality to others around us. Our words can be salted with grace in that sense. To real oh, to remind our, our brothers and sisters that we serve a Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That, that we serve a Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places we saw in Ephesians 1. That with Christ is all the grace we need. It's this marvelous grace centered in the Lord Jesus that gives real hope to the lost person that's weary and heavy laden with their sin. And it gives real hope to the saint that's struggling with some need. And so our words can convey grace-centered, Christ-centered reality. And when we do that, when we talk to others about God's grace, we need to speak to them as, as grace recipients ourselves. Grace recipients, are, do, you, do you understand what that means? It means, it means that I'm not, I'm not up here somewhere talking down to this person from, from my, my pedestal of self-righteous perfection. <laughs> but I'm alongside them as one who depends on grace just as much as they do. As, as you know, as the, the hymn says, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. I'm, I'm one who's, who's daily relying on the gospel myself. I'm one who's daily looking back to a blood-stained cross and an empty tomb as my hope. And I'm daily looking up to the risen, reigning Christ. And all of His promises and care for me. There's grace for me in Christ. And so I can point you to Him to find grace for you. Let our words be grace-giving words. Edifying words. And appropriate words. So that's what verse 29 is saying. Stop the rotten words. Instead, speak these good words. And I know the response most of us feel to a sermon like this is, is okay, I need to do better. <laughs> you know, we're, we, we think back over the last week and think, ah, I didn't do very good in this. I need to do better. I want to grow in these things. But, but before I send you out with just that kind of thinking, I, I, just, I, I would urge you, brethren, to try to think about this. As, as we have these other, these other issues, to think about it in a Christ-centered way. Not just, well, I need to try harder, but, but bring the encouragement and the reality of the Lord Jesus into the picture. Think of Him as the perfect example of perfect words. We've talked about a bunch of times, it seems lately, about second. Corinthians 3.18 about this thought that as we, as we gaze worshipfully on Christ that, that we're transformed by the power of the Spirit to become more and more like Him. And I think it's true in, in the realm of our words as well. As we meditate on the perfect, the perfect standard, the perfect example of the Lord Jesus, we're helped to grow to become more like Him I mean, as we read the four Gospels, I mean, aren't you continually amazed at the perfect words of Jesus? I mean, don't you, don't you just marvel each time as He just he answers the question with the perfect thing 
and his words are always edifying. There's always the right thing to say to the right person at the right time. And he deals with people so differently, doesn't he? He does. It's not the formula for each one, right? But he he deals deals with Nicodemus a lot different than the woman at the well in the next chapter, and so on. Oh, Christ is our perfect example. How he gave grace. To his hearers. And you know that was prophesied of Jesus long before, back in Isaiah 50. Uh, it says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. The Lord Jesus was able to do that. His word sustained the weary. And then think early in his ministry when he's there at his hometown of Nazareth in Luke 4. It says they were all speaking well of Him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from His lips. And saying, is this Joseph's son? I mean, Jesus went around with words that just were powerful to help people. They were gracious words. And I think later on in His ministry, when, when these, these officials were actually sent to catch Jesus and arrest Him, this is in John 7, and they, and they catch and they find Him and... and and they start listening to his teaching, and they get so they they get so caught up in listening to him that they forget to arrest him, and they kind of they kind of come slinking back back to headquarters ashamed, you know, and they're asked, you know, why did you not bring him? And what did they say? Never a man spoke the way this man speaks. The words of the Lord Jesus. And so he is, he is our glorious example. I've just been thinking some about the sayings of Jesus this week and, and, and just how His excellence, His perfection, and, and how I, I just I rejoice, I worship Christ for every word of His in my Bible. But it also gives me hope. It also gives me hope that, that by the power of Christ's Spirit dwelling within me, that my words can be more and more like Jesus' words. That He can use me to have gracious words fall from my lips and words that can sustain the weary with a word. That can really encourage somebody, really help somebody in a weak time. That my words can be more and more like His. Can be more and more filled of His truth and His grace for those around me. Amen.